Right. Well, what can one say? It's a great pleasure for me to to be asked to join this particular program to share some poems which have been inspired by wilderness. My, my life and history go back a long way with wilderness safaris. Back in 1998, Sharon, my wife, uh, Ian Nickler, who is a well-known ornithologist, died in Africa. The three of us went to Lunyanti Tented Camp, uh, an area which, which changed my life. And uh, it was there that, that poetry came in search of me. Yes, I'd written one or two odd poems over the years, but nothing with the force, the velocity, and the the, uh, the passion that, that came to me in uh, having been exposed to to wild animals. I'd initially started off by um, keeping a diary, and I found that, that prose just didn't work. And then one day I noticed that my writing was taking a form of verse. It's a strange thing. It was not planned. It was taking this form of verse, and the very first poem that I wrote in Wilderness was a poem called Wild Gifts. And here we go. Wild Gifts. To begin to know wilderness, something in me had to die. The pregnant parts, the motherly expectations of a safe delivery. Here, dead fetuses are for real. Vultures are the midwives of new souls. And to be abandoned is to grow. To begin to know wilderness, something in me had to come alive. The part that knew that night was impossible until I'd not only slept with the dead, but had been awakened by them. Here, the ancestors are for real. They are the shadows in our bones, and they come to us as wild gifts. The next poem I'd like to share with you is a poem called The Elephant Tree. Now, for those of you who know the Lenyanti area, there's some beautiful baobabs in and around that camp area. And there was one particular baobab which is looking more and more like an hourglass every day. It was around October. It is the dry season. Things were very, very hot. Um, elephants were browsing on the, the rich, rich inner core of the baobab, which, as you know, does not have hardwood. This is, in fact, a, a giant succulent. But I watched this tree, and I thought, I wonder how long it's going to remain standing. Well, Altebe, who was our camp attendant, came to me one day after I'd brought guests home from, from a game drive and said to me, Dr. Ian, there was a loud noise in the forest, and I knew exactly what he was talking about. And I got into my vehicle, and I dashed off to go and see this tree, and there was this tree lying, lying on its side, but surrounded by elephants who were now making the most of the lush leaves on the, the top of the tree. But I just so that this, this incident coincided with the death of a great friend and mentor of mine in my training as, a, as, a, as an analyst. She had in fact died um, literally days before this tree fell over. And when I looked at this fallen tree, I thought of her. I thought there's a parallel here. And so I wrote this tree. I wrote this, this poem called The Elephant Tree. It's a tribute to Vera Buerman, my old mentor as well, and a tribute to the tree, the elephant tree. No thing could fill the space of where you once stood, not in a thousand years. Your skin, wrinkled by 10,000 suns, was like an elephant's as thick, as thin, as silent. You were one of them. Your body was a grey gathering, a coming together of ancient memories, a tree that never forgot. And when you drank, you drank deeply, but not for yourself, for they fed from you. Every elephant knew you as a turning point, a mammoth milestone on a million migrations, a solstice tree. Your ivory, 
layer upon layer of white gold was within you. Without you, there were no tusks or tusking, yet they shaped you. I was there, great Baobab, on that day when you slept beyond a critical inch. The entire forest froze, listening, waiting. Suddenly, something in my heart tilted, and like an hourglass spun round, you slipped into another time. The earth rose up to meet you, and from your grey body, a thousand elephants untangled themselves. That is the the um, the elephant tree. Well, with poetry comes obviously the love of words. And here is a poem called Scavenger. Scavenger. I am a scavenger of words, a specialist in stolen lines, a thief of spoken meat, a pirate of tasty prose. Whatever I borrow, I keep. Hungry for words, there are no verbs I cannot bite to the bone. No adjectives without marrow, no nouns without a heart, and I always go for the heart. Burrowing between the lines, I scrounge for scraps in every script, every comma, every colon is a space in a meal, every dash a gap for a steal or a getaway, every vowel a waterhole. A snatcher of seasoned sentences, I scatter words like skeletons only to revisit them. With words, there's always something to come back to, something to chew on, a syllable here, a consonant there, something to sniff, to bury, dissect, something to resurrect. A mongrel of stolen matter, I hoard and feast on words like fierce, holy, wild, sacred. Scatter, healing, hunger. Right, how are you doing? Fierce. One thing that I, I learned when I got to Linyanti was that I'd arrived, I, I'd arrived, I'd found my church. And for me, it was a church with no dogma. I was just reminded to, so potently of the the qualities of wildness of what it means to be raw sensuous sexual uh, free autonomous uh, completely incapable of telling lies as fire is said uh, dh lawrence unable to to portray any form of hypocrisy i just loved the honesty of wildness and when things were done they were done fiercely the kill was fierce yes it was, uh, it was violent, but it was never, ever any violation. And here is one of my favorite poems. Fierce. I like that word, fierce. I like the way it aligns itself with nakedness and solitude. A fierce nakedness, a fierce solitude. And I like the way it is linked, it holds the word fire. I like that word fire how it ignites the cutting edge of poetry, refusing to be nothing less than a fiery edge, a fiery tongue. And I like the way it nurtures the word wild. I like that word wild, the way it weaves its way between yes and no, announcing itself as a wild anger, a wild joy. And I like the way it nurtures the word fierce. I like that word, fierce. So here we go. It's one thing to look at animals and to ask yourself whether you speak for them. Is it possible that animals speak for you? So I wrote this poem called Echo. Echo. I can only speak for myself. And then, not always so. For how much of you and him and her do I echo? In the mountains, in 
the streams and the sea? Do I not speak for you? Or is it you that speaks for me? And the eagles, the mantis and the trees, do you live your lives in the wild out there? Or in the wild in me? I can only speak for myself when I know your echo in me. Can you hear the lion's call in you and the eagle's cry in me? Now, behind me, I have an old blue shirt. This is one of my old favorite shirts. It's been around the block, it's got tears, and it's still hanging up in my cupboard. I refuse to to part with it. You don't, you know, you don't just get rid of old friends like that. And so I wrote this poem as an ode to this shirt, which I've worn over many, many years in wild places. Ode to an old blue shirt. Looking back, it was love at first sight. The look, the feel, the scent, the worn threads of a wild chemistry. You were part of my skin in deserts, in forests, and at the Lord Mayor's show. Remember the hand-hidden gossip and the tongues are aimed at your untamed edges? This time, unbuttoned, you had gone too far. Too bad, I loved you anyway. I was at home with you. I grew from you the meaning of the word care. To be kind with those who through the years grow thin, lighter, transparent, threadbare. It's an ode to an old blue shirt. Well, as you can imagine, um, wildness, wilderness has been a big part of my life. I love the notion of that which is untamed. And that, for me, is a dream which I would imagine has existed right from boyhood. This dream, that is untamed. Untamed. Sculpted from ancient rocks and stream, there's a dream in me, untamed. Unnamed, it comes alive in my silence and in the unframed manner of my waiting. Awake. Aware, it is there, coiled in the folding of my arms, in the holding of my breath, and in the deep wakefulness of my sleep. A force of fire and clay, it hunts along the edge of play, of hide and seek, and then turn away. Body of sand and skin, to know this poor is to know the allure of your grabbed king. Three months here, nine months there, always expecting and always the unexpected now i believe there's a there's a poet in every single one of us and uh, it's a voice which has to be heard it has to be raised and performed and eventually it has to be performed on behalf of others to become voices for the voiceless if if you know that, and you're not going to perform it, I'm going to ask you one question. How long will it take you to be a voice for the animals, for the wild places of this earth, and for that wild part of your own psyche? If you're not ready yet, I have one more question, and that is this. How long is it going to take? And so, here is this poem. It's called The Rising. One day, your soul will call to you with a holy rage. Rise up, it will say. Stand up inside your own skin. Unmask your unlived life. Feast on your animal heart. Unfasten your fist. Let loose the medicines from your own hand. Look, show me the lines. I will show you the spur of the ancestors. Show me the creases. I will show you the way to water. Show me the folds and I will show you the furrows for your healing. Look, the line of life has four paths, one with a mirror, one with a mask, one with a fist, and one with a heart. One day, your soul will call to you with a holy rage.
Right. Now, I don't know about you, but perhaps a few birds in the, in the, in the sky are quite as, as elegant as the, as the Batalea. Um, how can they possibly change the name of that bird to a short-tailed eagle? Well, that's, that's for the books. For me, and I'm sure for all of you here, that old Batalea will remain exactly that, that, that gymnast of the sky holding his bar as he characteristically flies his signature flight. Batalea. There are no wings that hold the high, invisible strings of the sky with the same silent elegance as this puppeteer. No act, no acrobat, to steer without force its course through the elements, to pull right, to lean left, to balance on air like a batelier. There is no sight, no heaven's fright, that calls to my soul with the same delight as this collector. No scribe, no sculptor, to better define the godlike lines of an avatar, to be less afraid of heights, to be less afraid to fall. So let's have a look and see what we've got in store for you here. Done the scavenger, and here we go. This, for me, is a tribute to one of my old mates, Ian Mickler. It's called the Roar of the Lion. The Roar of the Lion. Ah, for those of us who've had the, the, the privilege of having our bones rattled uh, to, in front of a lion roaring, it becomes an unforgettable experience. And in fact, I think it's just, it is some kind of therapy. It makes me feel an awful lot better. It certainly puts my, my role into, into life, into perspective. The Roar of the Lion. The roar of the lion does not come from its throat or its belly, but from the loins of the earth, the lungs of rocks and bones, and the hidden spleen of the sea. The roar of the lion is the voice of the valleys, of stars and streams and human dreams. It is the song line of the wind. The roar of the lion is the territorial command of the sun saying one thing, which is everything. This is where I stand. That's the roar of the lion. And so let me just find one which, or two here, which you might want to, want to enjoy. I've done the battle there. I've often wondered what it is in, in hunters who suddenly put down their guns, who say that's enough. Many of them turn to, to conservation. Um, when asked whether they would go back to hunting again, they say no. And I've often wondered what that is. What is it that makes a hunter put down his gun? And I have an idea. I think it is this, is that one day he looks deeper into the eye of the animal that he's about to shoot than ever before. And this poem is called Animal Gaze. It is in the animal gaze where spur becomes uncertain, boundaries no longer hold, and who you are is questioned. It is in the holding of the eye of the prey that the shift of skin takes place. Animal dreams awaken, human aims are shaken, the barrel bends the other way, face to face. You are hunting in a new country. Face to face, you are hunting in a new country. Well, let's just press on over here. Wild dogs. How many of us don't have a, have a soft spot for these incredible animals? Wild dogs. It is so. I am a dog. I hunt by sight. For me, the prey is in the eye, and twilight is my prayer. It is so. I run with a sense of pack. But look, in my tattooed clan of hunters, I am my own dog. It is so. 
driven by a hunger that has my name. I run alone, and yes, I share the taste of red. It is so. My ears are pricked to every forest song, to the thieves of meat, and to the ancient call of kin, my belonging. It is so. Smell I keep for last, and yes, sometimes forgotten. It is my wildest sense. And yet it is so. I am a man. And when I kiss my lover's mouth, or the soft folds of her elbows in a crook, or the pool where her throat tugs at a wild heart, I do so, not to please my lips, but to smell her, her breath, her skin, that far-reaching scent of spray, foam, and territory. And yes, I would know that smell anywhere. It is so. Smell is an endangered sense. Memories live in nostrils, you know. So do wild dogs. So we are coming towards the end of this particular sharing. Here are a couple more poems that I'd like to, to, to leave with you. Last year, I was in the Omphalozi. I took a group of, of uh, psychologists on a wilderness trail. We had four nights out, five full days. It was life-changing for, for some of them, as the wilderness experience usually is. And every time I go, my life changes just a little more. At the end, we had our, our, our summing up. We, we thanked each other. And somebody thanked me for... for my wisdom. Hmm. I wondered what on earth is that about? Wisdom. What is wisdom? And so I wrote this poem. One day I will be wise. One day I will be wise, but not today. Right now I'm trying to mind my own business, at the same time intertwined in the minds of others. One day, I will grasp the connection between things, but not today. Right now, a flash of resonance with a tree or a storm or a river, however fleeting, is enough for me. One day, I will learn to put the past aside and move on, but not today. Right now, my memories feed me, and besides, I'm watching a heron that hasn't moved all day. One day, I will realize the truth of things, but not today. Right now, a quest for answers excites me, and what is more, the search has given me wings. One day, I will find in me a calmness to keep others calm, to make right choices, but not today. Right now, I need to attend to the call of some wild in her voices. One day I will be wise, but not today. Right now I feel otherwise, and anyway, if it ever came to wild or wise, I know what I would choose any day. Well, it looks like we've got a frozen frozen line here. Okay, let's see what's happening here. Let's have a look and see here. Uh, well, we've gone off the air here, guys. I'm not sure what to do here. Okay. So, for those of you who can hear me, I'm afraid the the, the screen here from uh, from my side is is blunted. So I'm going to end off with a poem called Wilderness. Have we forgotten that wilderness is not a place, but a pattern of soul where every bird and beast and tree is a soul maker? Have we forgotten that wilderness is not a place, but a moving feast of stars, footprints, scales, beginnings? Since when did we become afraid of the night 
and that only the bright stars count, or that our moon is not a moon unless it is full? By whose command were the animals, through groping wing fingers, one for each hand reduced to the big and the little fire? Have we forgotten that every creature is within us, carried by tides of earthly blood, and that we named them? Have we forgotten that wilderness is not a place, but a season, and that we are in its final hour? So thank you for joining me in this afternoon, this late afternoon session of Wilderness Poetry. Thank you to Wilderness Safaris, and thank you most of all to the wild animals who have shaped my life. Good evening.